Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safford and this is Kitco News. Now this week in the markets, it's packed with key developments. I mean, we're anticipating the release of the December 2023 CPI data on Thursday, which will be crucial for the Fed's future monetary policy decisions and also global and major financial players like JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citigroup are about to release a set of their earnings reports, providing insights into the financial sector's health. Of course, joining us today is Sam Burns, Chief Strategist from Mill Street Research to discuss these topics and more. Hey, welcome, Sam. Oh, th hi. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Now, like I mentioned, we got lots to get to, but uh, let's start with the upcoming CPI data release and what your expectations are for the Fed's response here. Give me a little bit of what you're looking for. Yeah, I think the CPI data will probably come in roughly in line with expectations. And I think the Fed is much less uh, sensitive now to any particular uh, economic report or, or reading on the CPI. I think they're, they've moved in more into the camp that they're, they're, they're tight enough and it would take a really big surprise to really move them off of their current stance of keeping rates steady for now and then potentially lowering rates uh, later in the year as we see inflation uh, continue to decline. Yeah, you know, we continue to see uh, some analysts calling for those rates to be dropped a little bit closer to March. What are your thoughts on timing here? Any any assumptions? Uh, my guess is that uh, the Fed is not in a big hurry to cut rates. Uh, I think they've kind of given people that uh, indication that they're going to at some point, and that's kind of enough for now and from their standpoint. Um, they could do it in March, but I, my guess is that maybe May or June would be more likely. I think once they see that the, uh, the reported 12 months the trailing inflation data is much is closer to the kind of two two and a half percent numbers that they're looking for. Then they can be a little more comfortable saying that uh, okay, now we can we can lower rates because inflation is lower uh, rather than because of crisis or recession coming or something like that, uh, which would be a uh, you know quite a, an unusual sort of a turn of events. Uh, it's probably been almost thirty years since they've really done that, uh, but I think it's uh, what in investors are starting to look forward to now. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting coming into this election year too. Now, Sam, you published your weekly roundup report from Mill Street today, and you mentioned that the global equity risk model is currently bullish. Now, we're going to show this chart. I'm curious if you could elaborate on the key indicators driving this bullish sentiment, and where are we with the equities market here? Right. So the, the model that I use there, the global equity risk model, um, is, is a combination of different indicators. There's eight different indicators in there. But the big picture is uh, the direction of kind of market equity market movement and volatility, uh, kind of the trend, and then the kind of macro backdrop, uh, which is interest rates, uh, commodity prices, things like that, to kind of tell you what the macro backdrop is, 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 is saying about uh, uh, the likely trend in the, in the economy and, and earnings. And right now, what we're seeing is that the trend in equity markets is, is quite strong. Uh, we kind of broke out uh, recently in November, December uh, from the range we were in. We're about to make you know, new highs in the S&P 500. Uh, we've got, so we've got a strong amount of momentum coming into this year uh, in terms of equity markets. We've also got a decent amount uh, of momentum, in, economically speaking. Um, and the fact that uh, bond yields have come down some recently, people are starting to price in Fed rate cuts. That's also helping uh, kind of the backdrop improve from last year when everyone was worried so much about uh, aggressive rate hikes and inflation being too high and the Fed really being a big headwind. It's now shifted to kind of a more neutral or even potentially a tailwind kind of influence. Um, so it's, the model is overall uh, bullish on equities and tells you that uh, probably buying dips is uh, uh, probably the, the, the tactic to, to take right now. Yeah, I was reading that in the report, too. A lot of retail uh, you know, and institutional clients obviously buying the dip. I'm curious, what are the equities that you're watching here in the market? Yeah, so most of the things we look at tend to be earnings estimate driven to kind of see where the fundamentals are improving. And that's still uh, the technology sector, broadly speaking, uh, particularly software and IT services types of companies. Um, so even outside of the kind of magnificent seven that everybody looks at, uh, there's a lot of uh, stocks there that are seeing their earnings estimates rise. Um, some of them are expensive, and so you have to be a little bit careful about valuation. But, but that's where a lot of the uh, earnings uh, momentum is. And then also in financials, which we're actually going to see uh, report earnings here starting at the end of this week. Um, there's been a lot uh, better earnings estimate trends in banks and insurance companies in particular uh, in my work. So those are two of the areas I'm really watching is tech and, and financials uh, for, for sources of strength. Yeah, let's open up that can for a second. As I mentioned in the introduction, key earning reports. And just as you mentioned, 
coming out this week. Major players like JP Morgan, Citigroup, on that financial side, really speaks to the health of our economy. So what are you watching for in these reports and what can we expect as investors sit and look for guideline and, and, and insights here? I think a lot of people are going to be looking at uh, what the banks say about uh, both their loan demand, but also their balance sheets and uh, whether consumers are you know, paying off their loans on time, things like that, delinquencies and things like that. So I think um, the, uh, the worries we had kind of earlier last year when Silicon Valley Bank and all those other banks really got into trouble, uh, a lot of the mid, mid and smaller uh, size banks uh, had a lot of struggles. Uh, people were worried that they were going to have liquidity problems, uh, but what the Federal Reserve and Treasury did to kind of you know stem the the, the real uh, problems there uh, helped a lot. And a lot of them, I think, are starting to recover now. And so a lot of people are going to be looking to see, is there progress on those kind of balance sheet worries in a lot of the, the mid-cap and smaller cap banks? The, the really big banks have generally held up pretty well overall uh, since and uh, pretty have good, pretty good earnings prospects, I think. Um, interest rates that they loan out are higher than their rates they pay on deposits. So they're they're making good good profits so far. And so as long as the delinquencies aren't too high, and uh, things like uh, commercial real estate are a problem. And I think uh, people will be happy about that. Yeah, you, you elaborated a little bit there on the global credit risk. I'm curious, you had a note in your, uh, in your paper this morning. Break that down a little bit. Where are we in terms of current globally? Um, yeah, so credit risk overall has been kind of falling. Uh, so you've seen that the spreads on uh, corporate bonds relative to treasury bonds have been declining as uh, investors conclude that uh, there's really much less risk of recession now, particularly if the Fed is probably going to, you know, become uh, maybe consider cutting rates uh, sometime this year and, and not try to force the economy into a recession to bring inflation down as they have in some cases in the past. So I think uh, globally, uh, as well as in the U.S. in particular, um, investors are really not too worried about uh, corporate credit, whether, uh, you know, the, the companies that are issuing bonds are going to be able to pay down, back their debt. And that's generally a good sign. If that trend is sort of favorable, those credit spreads are declining. That's another kind of sign that uh, kind of not only are equity investors positive, but uh, credit investors are actually getting a little more positive as well. Yeah. I mean, interesting indicators to look at all around here. And finally, I mean, it wouldn't be a segment this week if we didn't at least touch on Bitcoin's ETF applications. I mean, as we await the decision from the SEC here, I'm curious what's your take on how this might change the landscape for digital assets and what should investors be prepared for here when it comes to these approvals? No, I think you're right. It's really a question of, you know, kind of what is the regulatory framework going to be for a lot of these assets that have kind of been, um, you know, off outside of the, the normal kind of traditional financial frameworks uh, for a long time now and kind of bringing them in in such a way that more people who want to participate can without uh, getting, you know, kind of uh, caught up in some of the, the frauds and, and issues that they've had in, in some areas within the digital assets uh, over the last few years. So I think uh, a lot of people are expecting there to be more uh, demand from, from retail and institutional investors once there is a more structured uh, framework that they can uh, rely on and they can, can meet all their regulatory obligations to investors with. Um, so I think it is uh, an interesting sign that, th that those assets are uh, growing in appeal. Um, and it's just a question of what uh, the regulators will uh, require from the, uh, the people driving them. Uh, in terms of uh, you know how investors can can use them, yeah. Do you think that there's more smoke than fire here? I mean, you and I were chatting a little bit off camera just prior to this interview, and I know that some of your clients aren't really looking to those crypto assets yet. But as these uh, ETFs get you know they get trading, and there's a little bit of legitimacy here, and it mitigates risk. Do you think that these institutional and maybe some of your clients will come into the market here? Well, it's certainly possible, and I, I think um, there's sort of a question of you know, can you own it in a way that, you know, won't get you, you know, lose all your money or fired? Mm -hmm. And then there's, do you want to in the sense that, is there a, an investable case for them? Um, and that's the question, I think, some of my clients that are more in the traditional, you know, equities and, and, and bonds and things like that. Um, it's, it's analyzing how, you know, how would you evaluate the, uh, you know, the valuation or the risk or reward for uh, Bitcoin or other digital assets, um, given that they're, uh, the use case for them is, is still uncertain. Um, relative to you know, what some people have claimed in the past and uh, and how, you know, what they would be used for over the long run and uh, and whether, you know, they would have their own intrinsic value um, as either a currency or as an asset of some kind. Um, the question is, you know, what would you do with it if you bought it uh, kind of thing uh, that I think is the longer term question that still has to be answered. 
But from a structural kind of regulatory standpoint, it certainly may, will make it easier for those who want to be involved to, uh, to, to join the party. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating time. So much to get to. Sam Burns, thanks again for the insights and joining us for all of what to expect this week. We appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. And of course, we'll keep an eye on all these developments throughout the week. Remember to download the Kitco app for the latest updates and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more coverage. I'm Jeremy Saffron. This is Kitco News, and we'll see you next time.